I'm Brad Slominski, and I'm happy to welcome you to our Dental Crafters DC Academy. In this session, we will be discussing tissue management, tray selection, material selection, timing, and tray seating. If you have any questions after the presentation, don't hesitate to call us at 1-800-472-8302. So taking a good impression, some of the things we want to discuss will be the materials to use within taking the impression, the proper tray to utilize to support the impression material, techniques of handling the tray and the impression material, um, some special tips that might help you, and some troubleshooting along the way. So where we want to start in our presentation is really talking about the marginal fit and how do we get good crown marginal fit. It really starts with the impression. The statement of garbage in, garbage out is a statement that's used within the dental world basically because the materials that we receive or the proper impression that we receive from the dental practices into the laboratory have, has a direct impact of the end quality product that goes out of the laboratory. So some statistics that we want to back up with this would be you know, some marginal or some impression errors. We've talked about in the past of 40 million impressions that are taken each year, 90% do not have all margins taken. That through statistics, 90% of the impressions that come into the dental laboratory were not able to have good readable margins. So that's kind of a, a, a kind of a shakeup uh, in uh, statistics and it does worry all of us. So hopefully in this presentation we're going to be able to get some good pointers and, and, and techniques and material choices to help prevent that in your practice and really supplying the laboratory with a very good high quality product, which uh, again really directly relates back to a high quality product in your patient's mouth. What we're trying to stay away from is the end result is a product that we don't have to remake, a product that goes into the mouth that you're proud of, that has a long lasting longevity in the patient's mouth. Um, if you really look at statistics, uh, crown remakes can cost the practice $300 to $900 per remake that really is nonprofit in your organization. Uh, we'd rather spend your operatory time uh, in new patients, new paying patients, instead of patients that have been there once or twice because we're remaking a product. So make every seating experience a good experience. It all, again, starts with a really good quality product. So let's talk about the proper tray selection. There's really three different types of, of trays that we can utilize. A stock tray, um, whether it's a stock full arch, a stock quadrant tray, um, or a stock triple tray or double arch type tray. Um, the other tray that, that is commonly used would be a custom tray. So let's break this down and where we would use each one of those trays. So in a situation where you have one to two units of a crown and bridge, um, very commonly and the most commonly used would be a double arch tray or otherwise known as a triple tray, which would capture the working arch, the opposing arch, and in essence the bite registration all in one is very popular um, and can be good quality if, uh, again, utilized in the right situation, one to two units only, and also with the proper types of materials and proper type of tray that is utilized. Um, stock trays for the full arch, very commonly used. Um, full arch are a, a really good adjunct um, to crown and bridge because it's giving you the full arch and it gives you, more importantly, the contralateral or the opposite side of the arch that, that you may be working on. It just gives a little bit more information to the laboratory to understand the occlusal schematic when we're designing crowns. The custom trays are uh, very commonly used for the extra detail. As you know, they're customized to that patient, and it can do a little bit better job on just capturing the detail um, of the patients. So now you kind of understand the, the different types of trays. Let's start breaking down when and how you would use each one. So let's talk about using a selected posterior dual arch tray, or again, otherwise known as a triple tray. Some things that you want to think about is rigidity. Now, rigidity is important in, in impression taking. And what I mean by rigidity is the impression material itself needs to be somewhat stiff. So there's a, some materials, the silicone materials that are out that are very, very, very flexible. Um, if they flex too much, um, you can have a problem when you're using a triple tray or a dual arch tray that is not very rigid. So the two types of trays we're talking about really are plastic and metal. So if you use a plastic tray that's very, very flexible along with a impression material that's very, very silicone or very flexible, 
you don't have enough rigidity to to basically withstand good accuracies in the impression. So when you're talking about using a dual arch or a triple tray, two things you want to keep in mind. One, again, selection of the tray. We recommend a metal triple tray or dual arch tray. One of my favorite on the market is made by Clinician's Choice. It's a aluminum tray. Obviously, aluminum is a metal, so it's a very good rigid material to support the tray or the impression material. The second one we talked about then is matching that impression tray with a good high quality impression material. Impression material that we're referring to again is something that's got some really good rigidity to it. It's got some good stiffness to it. So if you have as a recap, a metal triple tray with a rigid impression material, you now have a really good uh, choice of materials for success when you're using a dual arch or triple tray type scenario. So now that you understand where what types of materials to choose for a dual arch tray, let's talk about patient selection and where you would or would not want to use a dual arch um, or again otherwise known as triple tray. When you're looking at your patients you want to make sure you have intact dentition and what we mean by intact dentition is a triple tray, let's say you can only capture roughly six to seven teeth within that triple tray impression. But if you're prepping three or four units of that triple tray, that only leaves you two to three units of intact dentition. So we would, as a laboratory, would only have two to three teeth to articulate to. It's just not enough information to get a good proper uh, mounting to. So this is a case we do n would not recommend using a dual arch type system. You probably would want to go to a full arch so we have more intact dentition contralaterally so we can articulate the casts correctly. Again, like I said earlier, one to two units of crown and bridge for the dual tray or dual arch technique is all we recommend. So again, single units um, or adjacent units is a good choice up to maybe two units. Much more than that, I would not recommend using the dual arch technique. Um, now let's say we have a patient that has intact dentition, but maybe their occlusion is not proper. You know, maybe they have an open anterior bite. Um, you want to have intact occlusal surfaces. So of the teeth that are remaining that you're going to take an impression of that are untouched dentition, you want to make sure they're actually touching. So I would test the patient, have them open and close, and visibly inspect to make sure that, that the teeth that are remaining actually are touching in occlusion so we have good intact dentition that we can articulate the upper and the lower cast too. Um, also the ability to, um, to bite in the centric occlusion. We, we really recommend class one. If you start having class two, class three um, occlusal schematics, it gets more complex where it's nice to have more of a full arch type situation or full arch type impression so we have more teeth that we can uh, art visually look at and articulate too. So tray selection. Um, we already understand that you want to select a tray that has good rigidity. Again, my, my choice is that clinician's choice, the aluminum tray. Um, there are good plastic ones out there too as long as they have good rigidity. If they're super, super malleable and flexible, they're probably not a real good impression tray to utilize, but I like to uh, put my money where best valued, and the money where I best value, because I know that it'll minimize re my remakes, is a good quality impression tray and good quality impression, and that definitely will help drive my remakes down. So the proper tray selection that I want to talk to you about, now that we understand a good quality tray, is what fits best. So you want to find a tray that fits passively. It doesn't impinge, so you'd want to pick an alum uh, uh, aluminum tray or the plastic rigid triple tray. Have the patient always open and close and make sure that you do not have any interference from either the buccal or lingual arch wires. You want no impingement, especially in the retromolar pad area because there's an arch bar that comes back in that area, and you want to make sure that when you try it in, you stick it back far enough so it doesn't impinge on that patient. Uh, so when they bite down, when the material's in there, you do not want them being held open in that area. So you want to make sure you always try in your dual arch trays. Um, also in sizing, you want to make sure you're capturing, capturing the adjacent teeth and the opposing teeth. So triple trays do come in kind of a, a longer or shorter depending on the company. And the more teeth that you capture, the better off uh, we're going to be. So proper sizing is important. 
Once you have the proper dual arch tray selected, now you want to make sure you orient it uh, correctly in the patient's mouth. So we have the patient open and close, practice biting down, practice making sure that they do not hit any of the lingual or the buccal arch wires or the wire back in that retromolar area. Um, you want to have repeatable orientation, so taking in and out a couple of times, having the patient open and close, and you want to identify the contact areas. So when the patient bites down, you kind of want to know, okay, where are they hitting, where are they contacting in the teeth, and make sure they're not contacting in the tray at all. So now we've kind of sized that tray up. Now let's talk a little bit about the impression material that we want to use in that dual arch tray. The impression material... Um, it has to be sufficient to basically replicate any buccal fold. So you want a high detail impression material. You want a, a material that can lock onto the lingual and the buccal aspects of the tray because this material, you need to fill the tray enough so that the material will actually go around the buccal and lingual walls of the dual arch tray. So when the material sets, it locks around the tray. I have had several impressions come in where there's just enough heavy body material that it's only supported by the filament on the trip on the dual arch tray, and it's not even touching the metal or the plastic um, arch wires, which is very detrimental to the stability of that impression material, and quite, quite honestly, it usually leads into some type of a remake. Um, putty material, I don't like in a triple tray situation. Putty materials don't work very well. They're so, so stiff. Um, it's just not recommended in a dual arch tray. We like to see more of a monophase type material where the heavy body goes on the tray at the same time the light body goes in the mouth and the patient bites down. So we recommend that you actually do a tray try-in. And so it's, you know, selecting the proper tray. It's already been selected. You insert it in the patient's mouth and you have them open and close a few times. Now you as an operator, you're inspecting to see where the occlusion is actually biting and, and get a visual reference because you know that that's where you want them to bite back into. We talked a little bit about where we want to use the dual arch tray. I want to show you a couple of pictures here of, again, where not to use the dual arch tray. You see in this image, uh, that's a three unit, uh, three unit bridge. It's a triple tray used. And as you can see, there's really only one to one and a half teeth that is intact in titian that we would have to articulate to. So we're going to do three units and only have two units of really identifiable information to articulate to. It's just not a good situation. More than likely, this bridge would lead into high occlusal adjustments um, and problems for the doctor in seating. So you can see here in the next picture that we poured up, and this is actually poor of that impression. So in 3D now you can see where we have really you know one one and a half teeth. And if you look at the upper side, it's really only one full tooth that we can articulate to. Um, very very difficult to to see that now. We all know that cuspid rise or our cuspids pay, play a very large factor in our occlusal design of our crown and bridge. So in a triple trace scenario, you really don't get the contralateral or the opposite side of the arch. So you don't get to see the cuspid in the opposite side. And when we slide our jaw side to side, we use both cuspids and we have liftoff generally of cuspid rise. If I don't have that information on the other side, I have limited information to design the occlusal scheme of this three unit bridge, which again could potentially lead into some type of, of remakes or a, a high adjustment factor uh, while seating the crown. Let's move into the impression steps for a three unit or more type scenario or an implant. So in this case, we're going to be talking about a custom tray or a stock full arch tray. Uh, both materials are, are rigid. And again, you want good rigidity within your impression trays for sure. Um, that rigidity, again, will hold and carry that impression material so we don't have any flexing or moving. Um, you all know how much friction it, there is in suction. When you let impression material set in the mouth and you go to try to pop that impression material out, there's a ton of force that you have to put on to unlock that, that suction. 
So you could imagine the force that these trays get put under just trying to get that impression material out. And we want that impression material to stick to the impression tray, not in the patient's mouth. If it stays in the patient's mouth too long and the tray separates from the impression material, we now have a distorted impression. The laboratory pours that into that distorted impression. We make a crown on that distorted impression. It's an instantaneous remake. Two things about the impression trays themselves, you'll notice there's holes in both the custom tray and the stock tray. Those are for mechanical retention. And we want though the impression material to actually ooze out of those holes and it causes a locking effect so the impression material locks into those trays. Again, as a repeat, but these are trays you want to utilize in that three unit scenario or more or definitely in an implant scenario. So the advantages to the technician, and I would say really the advantages to the patient um, of using a full arch type system, um, there, there are several. Um, one of them is, you know, what do you do with both the surrounding profiles or embrasure spaces look like? We don't understand if we use a triple tray what those embrasure spaces all look like. But if you use a full arch, because you're capturing more data, the laboratory technician sees more data so we can close embrasure spacing better. We can understand the profiles of the teeth better on the adjacent, uh, the contralateral side. A complete picture of the opposing occlusion we have. So we, again, have liftoff from cuspid rise. Um, we can see if we get immediate posterior disclusion or if we, got, or if we have group function. Um, that whole contralateral arch is a ton of information uh, for the laboratory to give a little bit higher quality crown um, and hopefully minimize the adjustments. Um, articulating uh, the models in fully so I, you know I can actually see anterior guidance going into produsive so we understand what type of liftoff we have in a posterior from our anterior guidance. It also helps us determine if there are any parafunctional concerns basically because I just have more data. All of that results into a little bit better or hopefully less occlusal adjustment or less adjustments on your crowns. So of course I think if you talk to any laboratory you're going to see that that's probably the the type of full arch that or a type of impression being a full arch that we would recommend. But of course, we understand that in today's day and age, uh, the dual arch, because it's more cost effective, um, it's a little less traumatic to the patient. They're very, very common and they can be used as long as, again, we use them in proper situations and we manage how we take that impression, making sure it's good quality. So I'd like to move into com kind of comparing the two, a full arch versus a dual arch type system. Um, so what are the advantages, again, of full arch? Um, it works on all cases. Of course, laboratories prefer it because we have more information. Uh, you get the full arch contralateral information, embrasures, articulation, everything we kind of talked about here. Obviously, those are advantages. Um, dual arch advantages that we have would be uh, one step saves time. It's obviously a lot quicker for the doctors. Um, you obtain impression in the occlusion, and that really... You know, we still recommend taking a separate bite registration. And I know there's a lot of companies out there that say, look, this is a one step. You get the upper arch, you get the lower arch, and you get the occlusion. But from a laboratory's perspective, I will tell you 80% of all of the dual arch impressions that come into the laboratory, the patient did not bite into the impression properly. So if I use the impression to actually articulate the two casts, the upper and lower casts, they would be misarticulated. So we highly, highly recommend a second um, bite registration taken on the case. And, and why we like a second bite registration is I have a second piece of information. That information that you gave us is more accurate because we only recommend you put the bite registration material over top of the prep that you're working on or preps you're working on and one tooth on either side of the prep that you're working on. The other advantage you have, again, is it captures that lower uh, cost of things because you have one impression tray, you have less impression material, and uh, you don't have to have all the excess cost of two impressions, two trays. So obviously that's an advantage of the dual arch just because it's, it's much more cost effective for you. Now rolling back into the full arch, disadvantages of a full arch tray, it's a three-step process. It's a little more time consuming. It's higher cost of material. You got two trays, you got 
you know, two types or two impression materials, an upper and a lower, and and you also have an abundant amount of impression material. And statistics say full arch impression does cost you between $40 and $60, respectively. Just keep in perspective the cost versus the value of the end product. Other disadvantage, um, time to, to make custom trays. If you decide to make a custom tray in a full arch, it does take you a little time to do that. Hopefully you're using your auxiliary staff to do that. Um, if you ever want to have your auxiliary staff trained by us to help aid in that uh, proper uh, making of the custom tray, please contact us at Dental Crafters. We would be happy to do a custom course for your assistants to show them the proper way of doing that. So that is done by them and not by the doctor. Um, proper size, shape, and fit of the tray. Sometimes you have to stock several different trays, small, medium, and large, and even sometimes they're not formed properly, and you have to kind of heat the inside lingual arch up, and you got to flex it. So that does drive cost up a little bit and even just operatory space by having different sizes of trays. Um, and most of the time, you have to stock alginate also to take the opposing. As most of the time, we're using a lower cost alginate to take that opposing arch. Um, it just drives your cost up, and it's another material that you have to have. The dual arch system, on the other hand, disadvantages um, is it's limited. I mean, when you use dual arch, you're limited to one to two units only. So it's really fairly limited on the type of product that you can utilize to, to take dual arch on. Generally recommended posterior only. You start getting into anterior cases, we really don't recommend a, a dual arch. Um, again, because we're looking for capturing the cuspids and, and some more information. So we understand occlusal plane um, and levelness of the smile. It's hard to capture that with a dual arch. Um, contralateral information, we already talked about that. We're lacking the contralateral information. So it's a little, when we have lack of information at the laboratory, it's a little more difficult to have the really good accurate crown. Um, and you still need a bite registration, even though it's a, supposed to capture that proper bite. Again, as we said earlier, we like to see that second bite registration taken. So let's start with retraction and proper retraction. So good margins start with a good retraction type technique. Now there's a lot of products out there that are on the market. One of my favorite, and it's been around for a very long time, is just a cord retraction type technique. Now there's other products out there like Exposil. Uh, I believe 3M also has kind of a, a expandable putty type retraction material on the market. Now I get a lot of questions, you know, do they work? Can they work? Absolutely anything can work as long as it's used properly. Um, especially if you have margins that are supra-gingival, that were above tissue, a lot of those types of products work very well because we don't have to necessarily push the tissue away from the margin. Um, but if we're, you know, at the crest of the tissue, below the crest of the tissue, we're subgingival with our margins, we really need to practice proper um, or sufficient tissue displacement. Um, to distinguish the margin clearly. In other words, we have to push the tissue away from the margin uh, in order for us to have a good picture or impression material has to have a, a gap between the margin of the crown and the tissue for that impression material to go down and capture that impression. So impression materials that you want to use to do this, you want to have something that's very flowable too. So even though you're pushing that retraction away or retracting the tissue away, you want to have a flowable impression material to go down and capture that. Um, you also have to have good hemostasis, uh, moisture control. So at, you know, um, Ultradent has several products on the market and others of, of, of a moisture or a, a hemodent, uh, hemostasis type control. So you want to go around and make sure that you cauterize the bleeding and make sure that that gets stopped. You want to control any saliva so we don't have any saliva contamination. And in, in the same process, we want to use the cord to push that tissue away from that margin so that we can expose that margin. So if all this is done properly, we should be able to have that impression material go down and really capture that, um, that marginal integrity. And as you see with this, this next diagram, you'll see... When it comes to retraction, um, on the very far, the left picture, you'll see that the margin is basically touching where the tissue is. So if impression material goes down, you couldn't differentiate between the margin and the actual tissue. The middle picture, there is a cord packed in there. The problem is, is the cord is well below where the tissue 
um, can actually flex in and still cover that margin. So those first two pictures are really not a good representation of how we want to retract tissue. The far right um, uh, um, picture actually does show where some retraction was done, some cord was put in, like picture two, but then the cord was extracted out and you'll see how that tissue still falls over and it covers that margin again that impression material isn't going to be able to have a good view or capture um, where that actual margin is on the crown so when it comes to tissue retraction you want to make sure that you put the cords in and we hold that tissue away for roughly five to ten minutes to gain some memory in that tissue and uh, when you pull the cord out, that tissue should stay away from that margin. Uh, two cord technique is very, very common. And as you know, there's many different sizes of, of cords. Um, but you, if you can get a two cord technique and pull the second cord, leaving the first cord in, it always will provide a good retraction and keeping the tissue away from that margin. The causes of tissue recession, as you all know, Open margins can definitely have a huge irritant on the tissue. Overhanging margins or overcontoured crowns can all cause, you know, tissue irritations. And again, all of those three instances can be solved if we have a very good high quality impression. And if we can understand where the margin actually is on the, the dye itself, there will be no reason for the laboratory to provide any open margins or overhanging margins or overcontoured crowns. So just to kind of reinforce why proper tissue re re um, retraction is so important is we want to make sure we display that, that margin so there is a complete visual understanding for the laboratory when they trim the dye that they can set that margin exactly where it is so we can provide a very high quality crown with good margins that do not overhang and crowns that are not over, over contoured. Now let's talk about the proper impression material selection. Generally, there's two materials on the market. There's polyethers. There's also vinyl polysiloxene, known as VPS materials. You also hear them as polyvinyl siloxene materials. It's more of a silicone base. So some concerns when using the materials to think about. And let's talk about the VPS material. It is a hydrophobic material. And what do we mean by hydrophobic? It does not like water. So VPS doesn't like water. So you need to make sure that you control bleeding and you control saliva so that around your prep, you do not have any moisture contaminants around VPS material. It is, it is crucial to make sure that that happens with that. Also, VPS, VPS materials, um, the, the viscosity. Um, it has a little bit higher viscosity. It's a little stiffer type material. Um, and keep that in mind. Uh, and there's several different materials out there. You want to make sure you test each one of them and what works best in your hands. But you want to have the light body material fairly flowable so that it goes around that marginal area of the crown and captures it very nicely. Other things to think about for the VPS is acrylic and methylmethaculate residues. Uh, you want to prepare the temporary restoration after taking the final impression. Um, you want to make sure that you do that. If you take the and you prepare the temporary prior to taking the impression, you're going to leave a residue from that acrylic on the tooth that will inhibit the setting of the VPS material. So you want to make sure that you take your crown and bridge impression first and then prepare your temporary crown after the impression has been taken. Also, you want to clean the custom acrylic tray surfaces with solvents. So if you're doing a custom tray, you want to make sure that that's clean because um, the, the acrylic from the custom tray has a residual schmear layer on it, and you want to make sure that you clean that with a solvent before you actually put your tray adhesive on and put the tray in that custom tray. Now let's move into the polyethers. Concerns about polyethers. Concern about polyethers, it's hydrophilic. So it actually can absorb a little bit of water. Now that can work to an advantage and disadvantage. The advantage it can work to in, in is in the mouth. If the patient has, if you have a little bit of moisture, 
it can actually slightly absorb some of that moisture into the material. And it doesn't mean we get lazy on moisture control, but it is a slight advantage with polyethers. Viscosity, light body flows a little bit better. It's a little bit more flowability with the polyethers. Some th real concern of mine is the hemostatic agents containing epinephrine, um, iron sulfate or aluminum chloride, all of those chemicals are used in our hemostasis that can have a negative impact on the polyethers. So obviously we're putting it around the margin and around the, the, the tissue areas to control bleeding, but you do need to irrigate an air water syringe the material back off and clean that well before you take the polyether impression and put it on. So what happens if you don't, and you don't really do a good job cleaning it, what happens is when the polyether touches that area, wherever that chemical is touching, and it doesn't really allow the polyether to set on contact. So when you pull it out of the patient's mouth, it looks great. Where we see it in the laboratory is where we pour the stone up, and we see a little bit of pink um, residue on the stone itself, which basically tells us that the polyether impression material didn't set up around that area because the chemical was still was still present and didn't allow the material to set up. It's not a big deal. Um, it is a really good material. You just want to be aware of that and make sure you do clean that off. Also, a prep cleaner can also help you make sure that it's off that prep area. Another concern with polyether is it may interfere with the setting reaction um, and what I mean by the time is if that chemical is on the tooth yet and you take the impression again that set time may have deviated slightly where that light body impression material is touching that area where the chemical was on the prep so again must rinse it very thoroughly and make sure it's clean so we kind of talked about you know the advantages and disadvantages of polyvinyl siloxanes and also polyethers, each one of them you need to understand. That is an intricate part of your practice. So the viscosity, how flowable is it? How rigid is it? The working time, how much time do you have to get into that patient's mouth? Also the setting time. So from start to finish, how much time does it actually take to set? Every impression material comes with a diagram that you should study and your sh assistants should know by heart. And I kind of have a, a brief um, example of one of those, and we use the polyether impression material here. So if you look at the top category, is, is a Penamix soft, quick step, heavy body material. And you'll see in that material that the working time is one minute. So what does that mean? What is working time? The working time is the, the minute that that material comes out of the syringe, a clock starts. So you have two materials generally coming out of two different syringes. You have the assistant that is excreting the heavy body into the impression tray. You have the doctor that is excreting out the light body onto the tooth orally. You really need to make sure that if one starts before the other, that's fine, but both materials have to be married together in the patient's mouth within one minute. So let me back up. If the patient, or if the assistant starts and they start excreting the tray and the tray's full and 20 to 30 seconds have gone by and they're standing there waiting and that tray, it's been setting now 30 seconds. That's 30 seconds of your one minute work time. Then the doctor starts excreting the light body. There's a high potentiality that that heavy body in that tray by the time it goes into the patient's mouth is already starting to coagulate and set. And that's where you don't get good marriage between the light body and the heavy body, which can cause us some problems. So make sure you understand that working time of, of your selected impression material. Now, what is the set time? Set time is total time. So the again, the second the materials come out of the syringe, from there to when you can pull it out of the patient's mouth. So that's its total set time. Sometimes if you have a material that has a longer working time, it gives you and your assistant a little bit bigger window to be able to work together. So if one is ahead of the other, if you have a two minute and 30 second working time versus a one minute working time, you get a bigger window. You have a little bit longer set time so that even if you have, let's say six, eight, 10 preps you're trying to capture, I mean, that is a choreographed event. I mean, a six to 10 preparations, 
I think I'd rather use an impression material that actually had a little longer working time, a little longer setting time, so that you had more time to do it right one time versus two. So make sure you understand that set time. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that can happen now with these two items, the trays and the impression materials. So impression defects related to trays and tray seating. Uh, if you look at this picture, you will see that there are a few things wrong with it. And the first thing you want to look at is the stretch marks, or the drags. You see where the arrow is pointing, and, and how does that affect the impression? I mean, that basically gives us an indication that the impression was inserted and then it was pulled forward in the patient's mouth as the material was already around the teeth. And that can cause some pretty significant drags, pulls, um, elongation of the the crowns or the teeth that we're working on or the preps that we're working on. Also, the voids and poles in the molar area, if you notice those, the large voided areas. So when we pour into that, we're going to have kind of a misrepresented goober looking thing, if you would, on the potentially a crown that is important to us or a tooth that's important to us. Also, if you look at the anterior segment, you're going to see distorted linguals. So what would cause that? What causes that type of look in the impression material? It really comes down to um, the way that the, the tray is being seated in the patient's mouth. So this is the traditional tray seating technique, and I think this has been taught in several schools. You have the impression tray, you load it with the impression material, and the tray is positioned in the second molar area uh, to prevent any gagging. And then you take the tray and it is rotated upward to capture the anteriors, which in essence, you know, it on the gagging side of things, yeah, it could potentially help from that material going palatally and, and down and, and triggering the gag reflex. But what happens when you do that is you have a tendency to pull the tray forward as you do that. So that's what causes those drags and, and pulls in the impression material because as you're going up, you're pulling it forward, which is really not a good proper way of doing it. The way that is recommended it, it, in doing a tray seating is carefully positioning the tray so that it's perpendicular to the arch that you're going to be taking an impression of, and you do a upward motion slowly. You vertically seat the tray all at one time, and this basically allows you to capture a, an impression that doesn't have those pulls forward or drags forward. So hopefully that technique can help you in proper tray seating to minimize some of those pulls. Some of the other items that you want to look in tray seating is you know, any tooth that is, is showing through the, the tray or it's contacting you might want to start over. So what I mean by that is if there's a if there's a tooth that we're working on, a prep that we're working on, and you see that tooth contacting the tray or blow through, it should be an automatic start over redo of the impression. And you kind of see that on the picture to the left. On the picture to the right, you'll see that the tooth we're actually working on, it actually, the patient bit down and they hit the plastic arch bar of the triple tray or the dual arch tray itself. And that automatically should be a retake impression because it's inaccurate information, especially when you're using a plastic tray. So if you look at the picture to the right, you can see it's a white plastic tray. Now, what do you think would happen if the patient bit down? And they bit down fairly hard because you instructed them, well, bite down on your back teeth. So they do. But they had an interference of that plastic triple tray. What happens to the plastic? Does plastic have a memory? It does. So when you're biting down, it's going to flex that plastic tray. The material is going to set. And when you open, that plastic tray is going to want to fight that impression material and potentially could rebound that impression material back to the memory of the plastic tray. And now we have it a distorted impression, um, which definitely could cause us some problems. So to kind of back up um, some proper tray seating, we have a video here. And you can see in this video, this is the incorrect way of biting. Now look how the patient's biting, and then now they're side shifting and side shifting. So they slowly close, and then they open a little bit, and they move over and close again. And the end result is what you see in this dual arch tray here. As you can see um, where the arrows are pointing, 
it's because the patient bit down and then they opened and they had moved and it kind of elongated those teeth, which gave us this pretty severe distortion, um, which can be problematic when we're trying to match teeth uh, that we're capturing in the impression. So hopefully it gives you a good display of, of what not to do and some things that can go wrong. So now that you tried that tray in, you go ahead and you load the impression material, the light body in the mouth, the heavy body in the tray, and you direct them back into that same position straight down. And notice how you don't see any side shifting here. They bite right down into that impression material and they stay right there. Another problem that we see in the laboratory is tray movement. Um, and this video is quite comical because it really kind of exaggerates what tray movement is. But as you can see, this is a full arch impression being taken. And they seed it, it's seeded, and now how, you see how he turned that? When you turn the impression, when the material is already around the teeth, here's the end result. Notice how they're kind of elongated, they look like they're going crooked. Um, it's basically because that tray was seeded fully and then spun in the patient's mouth. So you never want to do that. You want to line up the tray in its proper position and passively seat it in parallel straight up and don't move that tray. Another thing that you want to think about when you do that is not transferring the tray either because we're really talking about putting the impression material and the tray in the patient's mouth. Once it goes into the mouth and it's fully in a seated position, you do not want to move that tray, which means you don't want to set the patient up in the chair as, that, as the material setting because you could potentially move the tray, which means you don't want to pass off the tray. So if you're seating it, you don't want to pass that off to your assistant because um, you potentially could move that tray. Any slight movement of the tray while the impression material is setting can cause distortion with it within that impression, which again can cause a remake. So keep that in mind when you're in your procedurals of who's going to take responsibility of seating that tray. They should be the one taking that tray out uh, when it's fully fully coagulated and seated. The next picture here we show is is some more tray movement. And this is a situation where you seated the tray and would have lifted up on a tray and then reseated again. And you can see on that labial side where it's just going to be distorted. And the next photo here, you'll see the 3D of that, which is the pour up. So I'm trying to do this lateral and I need to match the contours of the contra, uh, the contra lateral. The problem is, is we can't see the detail basically because there's, there's not good detail captured there. So that's why it's so important to seat the tray properly to give us full information as a laboratory so we really make a highly aesthetic crown. So let's move into the correct way of seating a full arch tray. And you're going to line that full arch up perpendicular to the arch you're taking an impression of. And you're going to seat that straight up into the impressions, into the patient's teeth. Let that material react. Don't go real fast, nice and easy. And now see how there's a nice hold on both sides. And at this point in time, that impression material is at a state of coagulating. It's starting to set. And this is where it gets utmost important to make sure you have absolutely no movement of the patient and absolutely no movement of that tray. So some other tray seating areas, you can see in the photo on the left, this is uh, been it's partially seated impression and then it kind of backed up and then it was seated again, which gives you two different positions. It's kind of what we just talked about, the improper way of seating a full arch. And it kind of gives you a, a display of what you would notice or see in that type of an impression. And the one on the right could be a result of seating it too fast. Um, also, if you see on the labial part of that, you don't see a real good blend between the heavy body and the light body impression materials. So maybe the timing was off on that impression material. The next thing I'd like to cover would be uh, impression defects related to the wash syringing technique um, and also some timing errors. And what I mean by timing errors is the working time versus the uh, set time of both the light body and the heavy body impression materials. The syringing technique of the light body material in the patient's mouth. So this is a technique that, that 
it's real easy to do, but sometimes, you know, we get little bubbles within those impressions. And you can see on some of these photos that we show you, there's small little bubbles right around the margin or on the prep area or, or in a, a real crucial area that we want captured. What we recommend is what we call wiggle stir type technique. So let's go into a video here. It kind of shows the the incorrect or the poor syringe technique. Now look at how the, pay, the 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 tip is just moving around randomly. What you're doing is you're introducing air into this light body material. So when you do that, it's just going to give you a result of having little air pockets, as you see in this picture. See these little air pockets that you have present around the marginal area. Now, when we pour a positive or a three-dimensional model into that, you're going to have a little bubble right on that margin, which we don't want. So, again, that's a poor technique. Now, let's look at, at the kind of wiggle stir type technique that we do recommend. And as you can see in this video, it's going to show where you put the tip into the material and you keep the tip in the material and you kind of wiggle and stir it. Now, look how they went 360 degrees around, but they went past where they started. This is a common mistake where you start excreting the material, you go around the tooth, and where you meet up with the, the material where you regularly, where you started to introduce, pause right there. Because there's quite, a, quite honestly, there's going to be a little bubble right there. And you got to wiggle and stir it and work that little bubble out of there and then continue to move around the tooth, totally encompassing that tooth in that light body material, not introducing any air into that at all. But there is this air blowing technique. So you put the light body on and you go ahead and you blow that light body down into the sulcus, which kind of pushes that material down into those crucial areas. Now you got to watch your working time here because it's setting up as you do this. And then you can add more material on top of that. Um, and all you're really doing is just forcing that light body material in the areas that we really want to capture. So if you do use that air blowing type technique, let's watch this next video here that kind of gives you a display of what it would look like with light body material if you waited too long. So this is light body that's been excreted. 36 seconds have gone by. And if you blow on it, notice how just slow moving the materials. It's not flowable anymore because it's already starting to chemically set. It's stiffening up, which means you've exceeded your your working time on this material. And this would be catastrophic if you're going to take an impression over it. And as a result, you'll see in the next next photo, you're going to see what happened when we exceeded that working time. So now look at this impression where you see the orange light body material around the preps, and then there's the green materials, a heavy body in the tray. And look at the seams. Look at the lines where they're just not married together. That is what it looks like when you exceed your working time. The next thing we want to talk about is set time. So the set time is the start of the material coming out of the tip to when you can take it out of the patient's mouth. We talked briefly about that earlier, but quite often when I'm in an operatory, the finger test technique is used where you kind of poke at it and you kind of poke at it. And yeah, I think it's set. I think it's ready to come out. You don't really know. We highly recommend you always have a timer. So if you have a material that has a, a three minute set time, set a timer for three minutes. When that material goes into the patient's mouth, look at the clock and time it for the three minutes. You're never gonna go wrong by going beyond the three minutes, but you are gonna go wrong if you pull it out prior to three minutes and the material's not fully coagulated. So kind of recapping where, where we've been through this presentation. Recommendations for improving clinical success of an, or impression taking. Select a high quality impression material. Use a rigid um, or stiff impression tray. Use within its limits, one to two units. Always use tray adhesive. So, and what I mean by always is in either a quadrant tray or a full arch tray. You do not need to use them in a double arch or a triple tray. Avoid contamination. Temporize after impressioning. 
understand the hemostatic contamination. Watch your latex. Make sure you use latex in consideration to, to um, interfering with the impression material setting. Retract properly to provide space and moisture control. Recommendations also uh, would be making sure that the material is properly mixed. Um, also, syringe and load the tray properly to prevent voids. Understand the following uh, of the working time and the setting times of the material. Use the clock to check that set time. Also, disinfecting the impression material properly. Read the disinfectant instructions of that impression material because each one has different recommendations of what to disinfect it with, what maybe could contaminate the impression material, and how long you shouldn't disinfect it with. When you grab a new cartridge of impression material, there is a catalyst and a base. And as you see, there are two tubes joined to one, and they have to mix themselves through a mixing tip. But when you grab a brand new cartridge, you want to take a paper towel and excrete a small amount of that material out on the paper towel first. And as you can see on this particular one, you see how much green came out? There's quite a bit more green than there is the white material. So if you wouldn't have done that, that initial little bit of material that came out of the impression gun, it would have not have been mixed properly, and it might not have set correctly. Um, maybe that material would have been right over top of the preparation, and it would have been a possible distorted impression. So now we have what we call an equalized catalyst and base. So we have this same amount. Now you would go ahead and you would insert your mixing tip on the cartridge, and you would be ready to go and uh, either put it in the impression or go ahead in the mouth if it's light body and excrete the impression material. Very important step to be followed. One important note, when taking impression material or the imp impression cartridges, you want to make sure that you match up the tips with the tips that you're mixing with uh, with the cover caps. So you see here in this impression material, it has a green cover cap and the mixing tip would have a green shank to it. This is a white cover cap, you would use a white shank to it. And this one has a yellow cap, so you'd use the yellow shanked mixing tip. Um, common mistake is if you accidentally use the wrong mixing tip. So if you use a white mixing tip when you see a green cover cap, the problem is, is that catalyst and base that are in this cartridge would be mixed improperly within this shank of this mixing tip because this is specifically designed for cartridges with white caps. So it would mix it cor incorrectly. And you can see even the height of these mixing tips. See how short this one is? See how long this one is? You want to make sure that you always keep them correct. So if you're playing around with different impression materials or trying them out in the operatory, or maybe a sales rep came in and tried to get you to try something new, make sure you're always matching the color of that shank for your mixing tip with the color of this cap. Um, if you are ordering new impression material, make sure you stock the right ones. You never want to try to switch those and, and um, use the wrong mixing tip for the wrong material. I'd like to demonstrate the proper technique of a bite registration. First, I'd like to note on how I have the patient positioned in the chair. They are sitting in a chair as though they are sitting upright at a dinner table. I do not have them laying back. Um, as the patient is functioning throughout the day, that is their proper position. It also, when they're sitting up, it puts the mandible in proper relationship with the maxilla arch. So very important to have that patient sitting up when you do this procedure. The next thing I want to have the patient do, and our patient is Linda today, I'm going to have Linda practice opening and closing three or four times, open and close. And when you close, Linda, I want you to close down on your posterior teeth every single time. Does that feel pretty repeatable, like you're hitting in the same spot every single time? Okay, open and close, open and close. Now stay closed for me. Now as a clinician, my responsibility is to make sure that I do a visual reference so I see where the patient is occluding when they're in, uh, when they are closing an occlusion. And I'll show you here in a minute why that's so important. So I have a visual reference on both right and the left side. Now, Linda, what I have you do is go ahead and open for me. I'm going to go ahead and take the bite registration material and apply it over top the teeth that I'm trying to take a bite over. And then I'm going to have Linda close on your posterior teeth in the same spot. Stay closed for me. Don't open. And as a clinician, I'm going to go in there and do that visual check and reference to make sure, number one, the patient's fully closed. 
and also not sliding from right or left to make sure that we're in proper occlusion. That's why it's so important for me to get that visual reference before I take that bite registration. After that bite registration sets, I would have the patient open and go ahead and pull it out. Now the type of bite registration material that I like to use is any polyvinyl siloxane. It's very rigid and stiff material, and there's several on the market, but the stiffer and the more rigid you can get, um, the better off you are. Go ahead and open for me, Linda. And you would take that bite registration back out after it sets. And the other real important aspect or to look at, and if you can see this with the camera, is see how you can see little blow-through areas where the patient bit all the way through? Very, very important to make sure you reference. Easiest way to do that is hold that up to the light and make sure that you do see some daylight spots in the area of the natural teeth that were not prepped to make sure the patient did bite through properly. Another note is if I saw daylight over top of where the preparation is, that would be a direct indication that maybe there's not enough occlusal clearance and the doctor would need to prep a little bit more off of that area to provide enough clearance for the crown to be manufactured. Now let's talk a little bit more about the bite registration. We already briefly discussed why we like to see a second bite registration um, and, and kind of cover this a little bit more. But you know, even if you use a double or a dual arch tray system, it still might not be in centric. That patient might have shifted on you. And again, I hope you have that visual of we were putting all that impression material in the tray in the patient's mouth, and they bite down and they do, they do a slight side shift. How do you physically see that with all the junk in their mouth? It's really, really difficult to see that. So that bite registration allows the technician to properly articulate the model, which reduces the incidence of crowns not seating and occlusal adjustments. Um, every case that we get at the laboratory, we always recommend that as a second piece of data to make sure that we're articulating our cast properly for you and for the patients. So in conclusion, excellence in crown and bridge is critical to the success of the modern dental practice. This is a money-making proposition if you do it properly. If you take your time and you do everything we talked about and you evaluate your impressions and you take a very, very accurate impression, you're going to notice that your remakes will drop significantly. So time spent in preparation is rewarding at the crown seat because you know your materials and you do it right. So the right tray for the clinical situation um, and the right technique can pay off in, long, in big dividends in making sure you have minimal remakes. Watch your techniques, tray seating, syringing, and again, timing, timing, timing. Know your working times and know your setting times. So what I want to leave you with is a series of photos. But what I want to train you on is when things do go wrong in the office, it trains you on what to look for and how to react to it and change it. So I left you with a series of, of photos, and I put different arrows that reference the problem. The first slide you're going to see where there's the green tray that is kind of shining through the heavy body and the light body. So improper tray selection, improper size of the tray. The second photo, there's not enough impression material. Notice how the heavy body doesn't go around the lingual and the buccal arch bars. Next photo, same thing. Just not enough heavy body or light body. And I'm going to let you kind of look through these and diagnose some of the issues that we've talked about in this presentation. And you'll see things that, that happened in these impressions that you can start to identify in your own practice. And hopefully you can identify it when the, when the material comes out, knowing that you can't send it to the laboratory. And more importantly, you should be able to alter your techniques so that you take one good proper impression the very first time. So I hope you find these photos to help you evaluate some of the things that can go wrong. In closing, there are a few things at the laboratory that we can supply you at Dental Crafters to help aid you in some of the, the procedures that you do. 
We do have steps in achieving the best aesthetics result in an anterior case. If you're interested in this, please contact us at Dental Crafters and we can send this out to you as a checklist of what you would need to send us in more of the anterior type aesthetic cases. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for taking part of this presentation. I hope you find it fulfilling and prosperous in your practice to continue to provide excellent dentistry for our patients. Thank you.